Welcome to chapter six. This chapter is on behavior. So is it enough to just stop doing an undesirable behavior? No, it's not. You have to substitute a new behavior in place of that old bad behavior. Because if something is not created in place of that old behavior, it will come rushing back. Um, or another bad behavior could fill its place. Um, like people who, for example, stop smoking and they replace that habit of smoking with eating too much. So anyways, this chapter discusses techniques for doing that, for substituting uh, good behaviors for bad behaviors. And so at this point, I just want to make a note uh, that we are going to be looking at our bad behavior more in depth so that we can use the information we get from it as baseline data. Um, and then we can use that data to help develop our plan for change, which we actually don't do until chapter eight. So it's important that you don't start trying to change yet um, because we want to observe just how you've been behaving so we can see what kind of things contribute to your bad behavior or prevent you from doing your good behaviors. Okay, so now we're going to go over some um, ways, techniques for substituting new thoughts and behaviors in place of the old bad behavior. Um, so the first technique is to distract yourself from the tempting unwanted thought or behavior. So for example, if you start thinking, oh, I really want to eat that cupcake, I really want to eat that cupcake, and your soft change project is to eat healthier, um, then one way you could distract yourself from that cupcake would be to, for example, recite a religious passage or do jumping jacks or count to 10 or chant a mantra or have a like go-to fantasy um, that you can think about. For my, uh, for my go-to fantasy, if I need a distracting behavior, I think about owning a dance studio because I always wanted to do that. And so I think about um, like when my classes would be, what kind of classes I would have, tap, ballet, jazz, when we'd have recitals, things like that. Um, and it distracts me from, I want a cupcake, I want a cupcake, I want a cupcake. So uh, what you want to do for this technique is select one single distractor and always use the same one. So it's always ready to go and you know exactly how to work with it so that when you're tempted and frazzled, uh, you have a very clear-cut plan for how to handle that situation. Okay, so for lecture activity number one, I would just like for you to write down um, three possible distractors that you could have as a tool for when you start feeling tempted to do your bad behavior. You just pull out one of those distractors. So uh, would it be a thought? Would it be a song? Would it be um, doing something, moving your body in some way, like jumping jacks? So give me three examples of how you could distract yourself when you're tempted to do your bad behavior for lecture activity one. So another technique for substitu uh, substituting new thoughts and behaviors is to choose a behavior that is incompatible with your bad behavior. In other words, you cannot do this thing and your bad behavior at the same time, so it prevents you from doing your bad behavior. Um, so some examples of incompatible responses, which are, of course, the behavior that prevents the occurrence of your bad behavior. Um, some examples of incompatible responses are smiling um, is incompatible with frowning. Going for a walk is incompatible with sitting at home eating. Going swimming would be incompatible with smoking a cigarette. Um, and so incompatible responses help us to do habit reversal. And habit reversal is, by definition, substituting an incompatible behavior for an annoying or self-destructive habit. Um, and so some examples of habit reversal include squeezing a stress ball instead of biting your nails, um, making a fist instead of cracking your knuckles, patting yourself instead of scratching your skin or your scalp. Um, and so you can do this habit reversal with negative thoughts as well. It doesn't have to be just with um, behaviors. So incompatible behaviors and responses work with anxiety and phobias also. Um, and so in case you don't know what a phobia is and think you might have one, a phobia is a strong irrational fear that interferes with your normal life, with your ability to function. Um, and so a phobia isn't just, oh, I uh, don't like roller coasters. A phobia is if you show someone a picture of a roller coaster, they start to feel kind of panicky inside and go into a fight or flight mode um, internally, not like they actually fight somebody or 
run away, but <laughs> that they feel all of those uh, symptoms that their heart rate increases just from the picture of the roller coaster. If it's an actual phobia, um, or even talking about a roller coaster can make someone with a phobia of roller coasters also go into that fight or flight mode. Um, so they are strong, irrational fears. Um, so anyways, the best way to eliminate a phobia is to develop an incompatible response to the anxiety that goes along with the uh, phobia. So for example, if you have social anxiety, what you could do is give yourself a task when you're at an event. So you could task yourself with finding out where each person works that attends the party. And so this gives you a focus um, rather than focusing on your anxiety. So an incompatible response to test anxiety would be visualizing success. Um, if you have anxiety that is applicable to certain specific situations, um, for example, like there was a man that had a phobia about cemeteries, but his uh, route to work made him drive past a cemetery. So he kind of had to deal with that. And his therapist told him to um, imagine having sex with his wife about five minutes before he got to the cemetery and then all through driving past the cemetery so that when he would kind of get closer and closer to the cemetery, he'd be very aroused and he wouldn't even kind of notice that there's a cemetery nearby. Um, another thing that you can do if you have free-floating anxiety is just exercise. Um, that will help to kind of control that. And free-floating anxiety is anxiety that's just always there for no apparent reason. There was another case of a, a gentleman who had claustrophobia and he couldn't really like be in elevators or any small confined uh, spaces. And so his therapist asked him what he liked to do and he said that for fun he did kung fu. And so the therapist said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go stand in the closet for a minute and do kung fu. Um, and then the next day I want you to go stand in the closet for two minutes and do kung fu. And he just kept working up the minutes of kung fu um, and then eventually he told the guy okay stand in the closet and do kung fu for five minutes and then just stand there for a minute and don't do kung fu right and so he was kind of conditioning him to feel comfortable in his closet through this um, kung fu so the kung fu was the incompatible response if you have fear of animals you can listen to music in the presence of animal um, or any anxiety really it doesn't have to be an animal um, but music is a good technique for distracting yourself because um, you can sing along to the lyrics and kind of get into the music. So another technique for dealing with anxiety is rational restructuring, and it's very helpful with negative thinking. Um, your book has a great example in this chapter of a guy who has social anxiety and he's at a party and he's really starting to panic. Um, and so he starts saying thoughts to himself like, oh, no one's going to like me at this party. Um, they're all going to think I'm weird. Um, and so he starts to use the rational restructuring technique that his therapist taught him, which is to kind of argue with yourself and say, okay, why would all of these people think I'm weird? They don't even know me. Um, people, I, you know, might like me. Why am I just automatically thinking that the worst is going to happen? So that's rational restructuring. You kind of go through each thought that you're having and test it out. Like, does this hold up to logic? Does this thought make sense? Is it possible that I'm looking at this wrong? Okay, so for lecture activity two, I would like for you to tell me what an incompatible response would be that you could do. Um, so remember the idea of an incompatible response is if you're doing this thing, whatever the incompatible response is, um, it makes it very difficult for you to do your bad behavior. For example, um, if you're trying to quit smoking, it would be very difficult to do that while you're swimming. So swimming would be the incompatible response. So try to think of uh, just one incompatible response for me, uh, whether you have anxiety or not, um, in, and you can use rational restructuring as a technique as well. Um, so tell me what you would use as incompatible, as an incompatible response um, if you were tempted to do your bad behavior. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, using relaxation techniques as a substitution for anxiety and stress. And it's important to note that even if your project doesn't have anything to do with anxiety or stress, um, relaxing can still make your brain more focused and make you more in control and less likely to have 
of what we call self-control fatigue. And when we get self-control fatigue, um, which is basically just getting tired of constantly sticking to a diet and controlling ourselves and resisting the delicious cupcake and things like that, right? So um, once you experience self-control fatigue, you're like exponentially more likely to do your bad behavior. So relaxation is a really good method for all of us to use in our projects, regardless of what our actual goal is. Um, so one form of relaxation that I highly recommend is meditation. And meditation is a learned technique for refocusing attention. And this can bring about an altered state of consciousness. Um, meditation is a great incompatible response to anxiety. Um, and it can be used as a tool that you do daily. It can be used um, after imagining a stressful situation or right when a stressful situation happens as a distraction. So it's recommended that uh, you meditate 20 to 30 minutes per day sitting up um, on an empty stomach. So it's nice to do it in the morning right when you wake up and start your day. Um, you do need a mantra, which is basically just a verbal focal point for your brain because the goal is to just focus on the mantra or the, the word um, over and over again and, and to kind of train your brain to, to be able to do that because usually there's what the Buddhists call a monkey in the mind, um, which is just all this chatter that's kind of all over the place in our brain and it never really gets a rest. Um, and so meditation is a nap for your brain. It's, it's a break. Um, and you just concentrate on your mantra or your single word um, as you breathe in and out. So you say the mantra in time with your breathing. <clears throat> so as you breathe in, you say your mantra, and as you breathe out, you say your mantra. Um, and so there's lots of benefits to meditation. Some of the behavioral benefits are that it promotes acts of empathy, increases compassionate behavior, fosters altruistic love, and there's a great documentary on Netflix called The Dharma Brothers that talks about um, some of these benefits of meditation through um, these group of inmates that they had um, followed in this documentary, and the inmates were taught how to meditate by these two Dharma Brothers um, who were experts at meditation, and it was very transforming for, for their lives. Um, some of these men had um, been accused of committing murders and never confessed to the crime and after this um, experience with meditation and learning how to do it and doing it for months they really changed and and some of them even admitted to these crimes um, finally admitted guilt and, and wanted to apologize to the victims mothers or if the victims uh, and the families and if the victims were still alive they wanted to uh, you know talk to them and apologize to them um, but anyways, you saw a lot of changes. It's a great documentary. It's called Dharma Brothers. Um, and then emotionally, meditation reduces anxiety, improves impulse control, helps combat stress, removes or, uh, sorry, reduces emotional reactivity, which is where you don't always think before you uh, speak, especially when you're really emotional. In terms of your physical health, meditation has... Uh, been found in studies to reduce chronic pain, helps combat eating disorders, improves psoriasis, reduces depression, helps control substance abuse like alcoholism, um, slows cellular aging, and then cognitively it improves attention, um, sustains concentration, speeds up your cognitive processing, and improves your working memory. And these are just some of the benefits of meditation, of giving your mind a break, basically. So let's watch this video on how to do it. Today we're going to talk about exactly how to meditate. I'm going to go over everything from where to meditate, what you should do with your body, what you should do with your mind, and even how long you should do it for, so you can start reaping some of these benefits. All of the information I'm giving you today is taken from a book that is recommended by just about every meditation forum on the internet. Mindfulness in plain English. Where should I meditate? Technically, you can meditate anywhere you like because it is an exercise for the mind. You can meditate sitting in a chair, sitting on the floor, and even laying in bed. However, there is an optimal way to meditate. It's best to avoid meditating in bed because you tend to fall asleep. Meditating on the floor with your back straight up is actually considered to be the most formal and beneficial way to meditate. And this is because it keeps you wide awake and allows you to sit for long periods of time. 
What do I do with my body? The first thing you want to keep in mind when meditating is your feet. A lot of well-seasoned meditators will preach about how your feet need to be on top of each other. However, for the majority of people who are beginners, it's perfectly fine to have them crisscrossed on top of each other like a pretzel. Your arms are resting on your thighs, your hands rest on top of each other and form a cup shape. Your thumbs can touch, it's up to you. What's important is that your arms feel relaxed. Your back is straight and your head is completely level. Your head is not tilted upwards or or downwards, just forward. In terms of what to do with your eyes, you have an option of meditating with your eyes open or with your eyes closed. However, for most beginners, I would recommend you to meditate with your eyes closed as it's easier to focus. If you do choose to meditate with your eyes open, do not focus your eyes on an object in front of you. Instead, look into the distance. How long should I meditate for? Now, before you start your meditation session, you'll want to set an alarm. This is because time tends to feel a lot slower when you first start meditating. So setting an alarm helps prevent a constant need to wonder about how much time is left in the session. For first time meditators, I'd recommend you start with just five minutes on the clock. As you make meditation into a daily practice and get more used to sitting in the meditative position for long periods of time, you can increase the time. Most people recommend meditating between 10 to 20 minutes. What to do during meditation? Here's where it gets tricky. Now there are many different forms of meditation. Some focus on the things around you, some involve reciting words in your mind. The one you'll be learning today is one of the most commonly taught forms of meditation and it's called mindfulness breathing meditation. It's very easy to learn and it's considered to be just as powerful and insightful as any other form of meditation. The focus of breathing meditation is, well, you guessed it, on your breath. First, you want to make sure that you're breathing through your nose. Then all you have to do is focus all of your attention on your breath. Observe the way the air feels as it flows through your nostrils. Observe the way your breath transitions from inhale to exhale. Observe that little pause between those two actions. Observe every single aspect about the way it feels. Do not judge it. Do not criticize it. Simply observe. What you'll quickly notice is that thoughts will start appearing in your mind and will distract you from this simple, simple task. Oh, what should I cook for dinner? Hmm, maybe I should order takeout instead. Wait, I'm trying to lose weight, so I shouldn't, or should I? When you notice your mind wandering like this, simply pull the focus back to the breath. This is how you train your mindfulness muscle. Now, most people who meditate for the first time will find it extremely hard to focus on just the breath for even a couple of seconds. They'll find themselves lost in thought quite often. This is totally normal, so don't criticize yourself if it happens, which it probably will. All you have to do is simply bring your attention back to your breathing. A good trick that I personally use to quickly bring my focus back is to focus on all of my attention on the little bridge between inhale and exhale, that little pause where your body transitions during its act of breathing. While meditating, try as hard as possible to avoid moving. Itches and urges to fidget will arise throughout your meditation session. This is normal. This is to be expected. Simply bring your focus back to your breath and the feeling will eventually go away. And that's all there is to it. It's a very simple exercise. What's important to note is how often you work on it and how much time you put into it. By making it a habit, you'll notice that you'll be able to have your entire focus on your breath for longer and longer periods of time. Think of this as your mindfulness muscle getting stronger and stronger. How often should I meditate? In order to really start seeing the benefits of meditation, you should meditate on a daily basis. My routine is 10 minutes a day every single day when I wake up. Some people like to do it twice a day like Arnold Schwarzenegger who does it 20 minutes a day when he wakes up and 20 minutes right before he goes to bed. As long as you make it into a daily habit, that is the most important factor. When will I start seeing the benefits? Well, first of all, you have to be doing it on a daily basis. The length of each session also plays a part on how how fast you see the benefits. But ultimately, it's hard to say because it really does differ from person to person. Certain people are less mindful in general due to the way they were brought up, so it'll take them a little bit longer to start seeing the benefits. In my personal experience, it took me about a month of meditating every single day before I noticed any benefit myself. I found myself in a better mood overall and was less likely to get consumed by certain
certain negative emotions. As I continued the practice, I noticed more and more benefits along the line. And that's it guys, meditation is very simple. It's just the act of making it into a daily habit that is hard. If you guys have any more questions, leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer as many of them as possible. Also, I'm planning on doing more Q&A videos in the future. If you want to be featured or if you have something very urgent to ask me, send me a letter to the PO box listed below and I'll pick the best ones to make a video about. Taking some deep breaths can really help you to relax. So the technical way to do deep breathing is to put one hand on your stomach, breathe from your diaphragm, and slowly breathe in through your nose for a count of seven, hold for two seconds, and then exhale through your mouth for seven counts. The exhalation should be audible, so you should be able to hear yourself breathing out, and your stomach should be pushing your hand up as you breathe in and down as you breathe out. So let's go ahead and try it. Close your eyes and I will talk you through it. So once your eyes are closed, breathe in through your nose. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hold for two, one, two, and breathe out through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six, in through your nose, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hold for two, one, two. Out through your mouth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In through your nose, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hold for two, one, two. Out through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, that's deep breathing. Okay, the next stress reduction technique is called muscle relaxation. And this is where you tense and relax muscles one at a time throughout your whole body as uh, you breathe deeply in and out. So go ahead and uh, follow along with this video and try out muscle relaxation. This is a time for you to squeeze away any tension that is stored within your body and replace it with heaviness, warmth, and relaxation. As your body relaxes, your mind will become quiet and still. Take a moment to settle into a comfortable position 
either sitting or lying down. Go ahead and shift around until you feel comfortable and at ease. When you're ready, you may close your eyes. Take in a nice deep breath through your nose. And now sigh it out through your mouth. Breathe in deeply once again, inhaling to a comfortable fullness. And sigh it out. Allowing all the tension, stiffness, and fatigue to be released out with your breath. Now let your breath return to a natural flow. Allow it to unfold at its own comfortable pace. And each time you breathe out, Allow the tension from your body to drain away. Surrendering the weight of your body onto the surface that you're resting on. In the next few minutes, I will guide you to squeeze and release your muscles. To let go of more and more tension and to replace it with heaviness, warmth and relaxation. Remember to squeeze more gently over any areas that are sensitive to pain or injury, especially the neck, shoulders and the back. Let's begin. Bring your attention now to your legs and feet. Tense your legs and curl your toes. Squeeze and tense these muscles. And now all at once, release and let go. Feel the sense of relief and notice the heaviness and warmth as it begins to spread through your legs and your feet. Draw your attention now to your hips and buttocks. Tense these muscles by squeezing tightly. Feel the tension building. Now let it all go. Feel the sense of relief in your hips and buttocks. Notice the difference between tension and relaxation. Feel the heaviness and warmth in your feet, legs, hips, and buttocks. Bring your awareness to your navel. Tense this area by pulling your belly button down towards the spine.
feel the tension building. And now let go. Savor the feeling of relief within your abdomen. And enjoy the sensation of heaviness, warmth and relaxation as it spreads throughout your belly. Bring your awareness now around your heart and lungs. Take in a full breath and hold it briefly. Feel the tension building within the chest cavity. And all at once, let it all go. Letting the tension in the chest dissolve. Draw your attention to your back. Now arch your back and draw your shoulder blades together. Gently tense and squeeze this area. And now let go. Releasing the muscular tension. Allowing your back to melt into the surface that you're resting on. Feel the heaviness and warmth in your navel, chest, and back. Bring your attention now to your arms. Tense your arms while squeezing your hands into fists. Squeeze and tighten. Feel the tension building all the way up from your hands to your shoulders. And now let go. Feel the sense of relief within your hands and arms. Allow your arms to rest comfortably at your sides. Enjoy the feeling of heaviness, warmth, and relaxation. Scan your awareness to your shoulders. Raise your shoulders as high as you can. Gently squeeze the muscles and feel the tension in your shoulders and neck. And now drop and release. Allow your shoulders to relax and soften. Feel the heaviness and warmth in your hands, arms, and shoulders. Draw your awareness now to your face.
Squeeze your eyes shut. Put your mouth into a forced smile. Clench your jaw. And then raise your eyebrows. Squeeze all these muscles in your face. Feel the tension building. And now release. Feel the sense of relief in your eyes, mouth, jaw, and forehead. Enjoy the pleasant, comfortable feeling of relaxation within your entire face. Enjoy the heaviness, the warmth, and relaxation. Now allow this pleasant feeling of heaviness and warmth to continue to spread throughout your entire body. And enjoy the feeling of calmness it creates. Now you can choose to drift off to sleep, or if you'd like to continue, the next relaxation exercise will begin shortly after the music fades away. Otherwise, if you choose to awaken, very slowly and very gently, bringing your awareness back to the room. Noticing the sounds within the room. Feeling the surface beneath you. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Take in a slow deep breath. And as you exhale, feel yourself awaken. You feel refreshed, peaceful, and calm. Guided imagery is where you listen to a story and you try to visualize the story and only the story in as much detail as you can without letting external thoughts enter in your mind. So go ahead and listen to this example of guided imagery. Settling in to a comfortable position, sitting or lying down, and make sure you're warm. And when you're ready, close your eyes. Begin by taking a nice slow deep breath, inhaling to a comfortable fullness, breathing deep into the belly, 
Hold the breath for a moment and then release the breath. Again, breathing in, sending the warm energy of the breath to any part of your body that feels tense or sore, and then releasing the tension with the exhale. One last time, deep breath in, hold, and release the breath. Allow your shoulders to relax as you breathe out. Now imagine yourself on a beautiful beach on a warm summer morning. The salty sea breeze feels warm and moist against your skin. and the sun has almost finished its ascent into the brilliant blue sky. Now imagine that you're walking along this quiet, warm, private beach. You're dressed comfortably and you can be alone or with someone close to you, whichever you prefer. As you walk along the water's edge, you feel the coolness of the damp sand underneath your feet. And you can feel the gentle caress of the cool water as it washes over your toes each time the waves roll in. As you continue to walk, you feel relaxed by the sound of the rhythmical rolling of the ocean waves. As the waves roll in, and as the waves roll out. And under your arm, you carry a soft, rolled up towel. You turn away from the water's edge and you look at the soft, white, warm sand and you choose a place where you can sit alone and be still. You put down your towel and you sit down for a while. You feel the warmth of the sand beneath you. and it feels soothing against your hips, your legs, and your feet. And as you sit here, you look out over the deep blue waves and up into the sky, and you see the brilliant yellow sun The sky is completely clear, except for one fluffy cloud near the horizon over the water. And as you sit here on the warm sand, you feel the gentle warmth of the sun on your body. the soothing sensation of the warm sun relaxes your head, your face, your 
your shoulders, your arms, your back. and your feet. You feel very relaxed and very calm. You have no cares, no worries. You feel free from your day-to-day concerns and time is no measure. For the next few minutes, continue to enjoy this pleasant sensation of stillness and peace, warmth and quiet. And in the peacefulness of this moment, you decide that it's time for you to go back now. Taking in the serenity of this place one last time, you rise to your feet and walk slowly back up the beach along the water's edge and once again you feel the cool dampness of the sand underneath your feet you continue to walk along the beach from where you came feeling relaxed peaceful and at ease. Remember that whenever you feel stressed or tense or need a break in your day, you can bring yourself back to this beach, back to this moment to relax your body and to relax your mind. And now very gently and very slowly coming back into the room becoming aware of the sounds within the room Feeling the surface beneath you, and when you're ready, open your eyes, feel yourself awaken, you feel refreshed, relaxed, and at ease. Other stress reduction techniques include therapeutic massage, which is used to discover where and how you hold your tension. Research shows that it reduces pain and depression, 
as well as increases alertness and your immune system functioning. And then there is yoga, which reduces stress, expands awareness, has the potential to deepen spirituality, and increases flexibility. It also decreases physical problems like arthritis, back pain, digestive disorders, insomnia, diabetes, migraines, varicose veins, and obesity. So go ahead and follow along with this yoga video that you can do in your chair. Do as much or as little as you feel comfortable with. This is a short sequence of yoga postures you can do on your chair at your desk, in the office, or obviously at home, uh, at any time, just to have a little bit of a stretch and a break from what you're doing. So to start with, you want to sit at the front edge of the chair, sitting nice and tall and high on your sit bones, and the feet are flat on the floor in line with the knees and the hips. So we start with just doing a little bit of a shoulder circle here to get us moving nice big circles. Inhale and exhale and one more inhale and exhale. Bring the fingertips to the shoulders. Inhale and exhale. Big circles with the elbows. Inhale and exhale and one more inhale and exhale relax the arms again and then go forwards inhale coming forwards exhale inhale and exhale and again now we can do that with the elbows as well up coming forwards together and down Inhaling, together in front, exhale, one more, and release. Take your arms up as you inhale, reaching up tall, and exhale, release the arms. And again, inhale, and exhale. This time we inhale, and on the exhalation, take your whole body with you, coming forwards over the legs into a forward fold. Relax the arms and shoulders and the head. Take a deep breath in. To come out, bring your arms forwards into space, reach forwards and then reach up. And exhale to release the arms. Bring your right foot forwards and flex that foot so you've got a long leg here. And then we're just going to lean forwards, resting on the opposite thigh. And that gives us quite a nice stretch and opening at the back of the leg here. The more you pull those toes in towards you, the stronger it gets. And also you could think about reaching your heart forwards to lengthen through the back of the body a bit more. Again, that gives you more opening through the back of the leg. Let's just take a couple more deep breaths here. And then slowly coming up. And take your foot back, other side. Left foot out in front, pull those toes in towards you. Come forwards and rest into that opposite leg. Now the more you pull those toes in towards you, you can feel it in your calf. And then reach your heart forwards a bit more and you can feel it more in your thigh. And let's take another deep breath here. And relax. Coming out. Bring your arms up. Interlock the fingers behind your head, rooting down through both feet, and just very gently come over to the side into the side stretch here. Inhale, coming up, and exhale over to the other side. Inhale. 
inhale and exhale. Inhale, final one, to the other side and straighten up. Release the fingers, interlock in front and reach the hands away as you draw the shoulders back and down the body. Keep them back and down as you float the arms up. Breathe into the stretch. Allow the chest to drop away from your hands. As you open the palms of the hands up to the ceiling. Good. Take another deep breath in. And as you exhale, release and let's circle the hands down. Limbering the wrists a little. Include the fingers. Good. And shake it out. Shake, 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 shake. Really down to the floor. Go for it. Shake it all off. Shake it away. Good. Good shake. It was really quite a good release sometimes. Good. Now from here we do a little twist. For that we need to turn sideways on the chair so you can see that I'm going to turn my chair. You obviously don't need to do that. So I'm sitting sideways comfortably on my chair and then I'm turning towards the back of the chair. Hands can come round the sides here and then I draw my belly and then my ribs and my chest over towards the back of the chair. Keep the shoulders nice and relaxed here and then maybe you can just look over the back of the chair, maybe you look over your back shoulder. So you've got a twist through the spine, breathing wide and deep into the ribcage here. Every time you exhale, there might be a bit more space opening up for a bit more rotation. And then slowly come back head first, shoulders, ribs and belly. And we'll do that to the other side. Again, you don't need to move your chair. You just swivel around to the other side, hands to the side of the back of the chair. Draw the belly back first, so it's like you're wrapping your torso around your spine from the base up. Rib cage, chest, shoulders. Maybe the neck and the head want to get involved too. And you can look over your back shoulder. Use your exhalations to soften <sighs> into the rib cage, keeping your shoulders soft. And let's take another breath here. And then slowly coming back. Head first, shoulders, chest, ribs and belly. Come to sit comfortably on your chair so you can just sit back and even lean back if you like. If your heels come off the floor because your chair might be a little bit too high for your legs, then place something underneath your feet like a block or a book or just something. So the feet still want to be flat on the floor. And you can just use the support of the back of the chair a little. We're going to do a little movement through the neck here. So let the head drop. Just let it go. And then take the chin over to the right shoulder. And then take a straight line up to the top corner of the room. Draw a line across the ceiling to the opposite corner of the room and then a straight line down. The chin comes down to the left shoulder and then let the chin drop back to the chest like a pendulum and flow the head up back to the centre and then take the chin up to the ceiling pulling a bit of a funny face so you get a stretch in the throat. And release, coming back. And then we go over to the other side. So drop the chin over to the left. Straight line up to the top corner of the room. Draw a line across the ceiling. 
and a straight line down. Chin to the shoulder and then back to the chest and float the head back up and just poke the chin away one more time and relax and to finish up we'll just take three lovely feel good breaths so big inhale <sighs> sliding that out two more Maybe just sit quietly for another couple of moments. Allow yourself to settle with the practice. And then just slowly allow yourself to come back. And carry on with whatever you might have been doing before. Or maybe do something different. Maybe relax a little more. Enjoy your practice. Namaste. So mindfulness is really a lifestyle stress reduction technique and the purpose is to try to live in the moment. So to be mindful of the pre present moment, to experience each moment fully, to be fully aware of your external and internal environment and to embrace what is going on in each second. So the process is to pay active attention to the here and now, to focus on what is happening rather than what if this happens. And the theory behind mindfulness is that we can make moments wonderful if we can stop running into the future, worrying about the past, and being focused on material things. So it's often said that uh, the past is something that is uh, not changeable, you can't redo it, and the future is not guaranteed, so all we have is this present moment. But a person once told me that the past is a memory, and the future is something you create in your imagination, so neither of them are real. The only thing that is real is this moment that you are living in right now, so you might as well embrace it. Research also shows that people who spend a lot of time thinking about the past, feeling shame, regret, anger, hurt about things that have happened in the past are more likely to suffer from depression. And people who spend a lot of time worrying about the future tend to suffer from anxiety. So let's go ahead and watch this video on mindfulness. <laughs> We live in an incredibly busy world. The, the pace of life is often frantic, our minds are always busy, and we're always doing something. So with that in mind, I'd like you just to take a moment to think, when did you last take any time to do nothing? Just 10 minutes, undisturbed. And when I say nothing, I do mean nothing. So that's no emailing, texting, no internet, no TV, no chatting, no eating, no reading. Not even sitting there reminiscing about the past or planning for the future. Simply doing nothing. I see a lot of very blank faces. <laughs> My thinking is it's probably have to go a long way back. And this is an extraordinary thing, right? We're talking about our mind. The mind, our most valuable and precious resource through which we experience every single moment of our life. The mind that we rely upon to be happy, content, emotionally stable as individuals, and at the same time to be kind and thoughtful and considerate in our relationships with others. This is the same mind that we depend upon to be focused, creative, spontaneous, and to perform at our very best in everything that we do. And yet, we don't take any time out to look after it. In fact, we spend more time looking after our cars, our clothes, and our hair than we... Okay, maybe not our hair, but... <laughs> You see where I'm going. The, the result, of course, is that we get stressed. You know, the mind whizzes away 
like a washing machine going round and round, lots of difficult, confusing emotions. And we don't really kind of know how to deal with that. And the, the sad fact is that we are so distracted that we're no longer present in the world in which we live. We miss out on the things that are most important to us. And the crazy thing is that everybody just assumes, well, that's the way life is, so we just kind of got to get on with it. But that's really not how it has to be. So I was about 11 when I went along to my first meditation class. And trust me, it had all the stereotypes that you can imagine, the sitting cross-legged on the floor, the incense, the herbal tea, the vegetarians, the whole deal. But um, my mom was going, and I was intrigued, so I went along with her. I'd also seen a few kung fu movies, and secretly I kind of thought I might be able to learn how to fly, but I was very young <laughs> at the time, you know. Now, as I was there, you know, I guess like a lot of people, I assumed that it was just an aspirin for the mind. You get stressed, you do some meditation. I hadn't really thought that it could be sort of preventative in nature. Until I was about sort of 20, when a number of things happened in my life in quite quick succession, really serious things, which just flipped my life upside down. And all of a sudden, I was inundated with thoughts, inundated with difficult emotions that I didn't know how to cope with. Every time I sort of pushed one down, another one would just sort of pop back up again. It was a really very stressful time. I guess we all deal with stress in different ways. Some people will bury themselves in work, grateful for the, the distraction. Others will turn to their friends, their family, looking for support. Some people hit the bottle, start taking medication. My own way of dealing with it was to become a monk. So I quit my degree. I headed off to the Himalayas. I became a monk, and I started studying meditation. People often ask me you know, what I learned from that time. Well, obviously it changed things. You know? Let's face it. Becoming a celibate monk is going to change a number of things. But it was more than that. You know, it, it taught me, it gave me a greater appreciation and understanding for the present moment. By that, I mean not being lost in thought, not being distracted, not being overwhelmed by difficult emotions, but instead learning how to be in the here and now, how to be mindful, how to be present. I think the present moment is so underrated. It sounds so ordinary. And yet, we spend so little time in the present moment that it's anything but ordinary. There was a, a research paper that came out of Harvard just recently that said, on average, our minds are lost in thought almost 47% of the time. 47%. At the same time, this sort of constant mind-wandering is also a direct cause of unhappiness. Now, we're not here for that long anyway. But to spend almost half of our life lost in thought and potentially quite unhappy, I don't know, it's just, it just kind of seems tragic, actually, especially when there's something we can do about it. When there's a, a positive, practical, achievable, scientifically proven technique which allows our mind to be more healthy, to be more mindful and less distracted. And the beauty of it is that even though it kind of need only take about 10 minutes a day, it impacts our entire life. But we need to know how to do it. We need an exercise, we need a framework to learn how to be more mindful. That's essentially what meditation is. It's familiarizing ourselves with the present moment. But we also need to know how to approach it in the right way, to get the best from it. And that's what these are for, in case you've been wondering. Because most people assume the meditation is all about sort of stopping thoughts, getting rid of emotions, somehow controlling the mind. But actually, it's quite different from that. It's more about sort of stepping back, sort of seeing the thought clearly, witnessing it coming and going, emotions coming and going without judgment, but with a relaxed, focused mind. So for example, right now, if I focus too much, on the balls, then there's no way that I can relax and talk to you at the same time. Equally, if I relax too much talking to you, then there's no way I can focus on the balls. I'm going to drop them. Now, in life and in meditation, there'll be times when the focus becomes a little bit too intense and life starts to feel a bit like this. It's a very uncomfortable way to live life when we get this tight and stressed. At other times, we might take our foot off the gas a little bit too much. And things just become a little bit like this. And of course, in meditation, we can end up falling asleep. 
So we're looking for a balance of focus relaxation where we can allow thoughts to come and go without all the usual involvement. Now, what usually happens when we're learning to be mindful is that we get distracted by a thought. Let's say this is an anxious thought. So everything's going fine and then we see the anxious thought and it's like, oh, I didn't realize I was worried about that. You go back to it, repeat it. Oh, I am worried. Oh, I really am worried. Wow, there's so much anxiety. And before we know it, right, we're anxious about feeling anxious. You know, this is crazy. We do this all the time, even on an everyday kind of level. If you think about the last time, I don't know, you had a wobbly tooth. You know it's wobbly, and you know that it hurts. But what do you do every 20, 30 seconds? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It does hurt. And we reinforce the storyline, right? And we just keep telling ourselves. And we do it all the time. And it's only in learning to watch the mind in this way that we can start to let go of those storylines and patterns of mind. But when you sit down and you watch the mind in this way, you might see many different patterns. You might find a mind that's really sort of restless and the whole time. You know, don't be surprised if you feel a bit agitated in your body when you sit down to do nothing and your mind feels like that. You might find a mind that's very sort of dull and boring and it's just almost mechanical. It just sort of seems it's as if you're just sort of getting up, going to work, eat, sleep, get up, up. Or it might just be that one little nagging thought that just goes round and round and round to your mind. Whatever it is, meditation offers the opportunity, the potential to step back and to get a different perspective, to see that things aren't always as they appear. You know, we can't change every little thing that happens to us in life. But we can change the way that we experience it. That's the potential of meditation, of mindfulness. You don't have to burn any incense, and you definitely don't have to sit on the floor. All you need to do is to take 10 minutes out a day to step back, to familiarize yourself with the present moment so that you get to experience a greater sense of focus, calm, and clarity in your life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so what I'd like for you to do for uh, lecture activity number three is choose one of the relaxation techniques that you learned about uh, in this lecture and uh, tell me which one you are going to do when it becomes time to start trying to change. So we're not trying to change yet, so you really shouldn't do these relaxation techniques quite yet. But when it is time to start doing them, which one do you think you're going to do and why? Okay, so another thing that we want to do is develop new behaviors. Um, and so we need to create good behaviors that we're going to do to replace our bad behaviors. So rehearsing desired or good behaviors over and over is really the best way to master it. However, we can't always rehearse our good behavior. For example, if we have test anxiety, maybe we don't have enough exams to practice um, these techniques a lot, so it makes it difficult. Or if you have a fear of snakes, but there's not really snakes around all the time, then how do you, um, you know, have these rehearsal good behaviors. So one of the things that you can do is imagined rehearsal. An imagined rehearsal is a form of, ver of visual self-instruction involving practicing behavior in your imagination. And it actually enhances the likelihood of success in real performance. And so it's used in a lot of different uh, arenas. Um, it's used in sports a lot. But it works in all cases, and really it's just probably more commonly known as visualization. Uh, Phil Jackson, when he was the coach of the Lakers, very famously would have the players sit in a circle before games and uh, visualize aloud to one another how the game was going to go play by play by play start to finish. Um, and they, they won a lot of championships, so maybe there's something to it. Um, so what you want to do is relax and imagine all details vividly. Uh, so for example, if you have social anxiety, you can imagine the face of the person that would give you social anxiety, uh, the emotions that you would feel, the smells that you would feel, the expressions on people's faces, the thoughts that you would have, the situation that you would be in, um, and then you can kind of imagine yourself um, doing your good behavior in that in the face of all that social anxiety. 
And so maybe your good behavior is like positive thinking, for example. You can use religion if you are religious. A study showed that this helps you to have a greater success in doing your good behavior. So you can imagine, uh, like if you're a Christian, for example, you can imagine God is uh, with you when you feel tempted to do your bad behavior. Um, another thing that you can do is remember a time when you coped with really well with a negative situation related to your bad behavior and then transfer that confidence to the um, imagined problem. So imagine yourself feeling tempted to do your bad behavior or starting to do your bad behavior and then um, think about a time that you coped with a, situ a situation really well when you were tempted to do your bad behavior and just kind of transfer that confidence into your um, visualization. And then another thing you can do is combine relaxation and imagined rehearsal. Uh, so you could use a relaxation technique to become completely relaxed and then use imagined rehearsal afterwards. Um, so you're very relaxed as you're going into this tempting situation that you're imagining. Um, and then you can imagine yourself doing the good behavior. So as an activity, imagine yourself successfully engaging in your good behavior in a stressful situation when you're tempted to do your, your bad behavior. So maybe you're tempted to eat unhealthy food or drink or think negatively or curse or smoke. Um, so if you're tempted to do that, imagine yourself successfully engaging in a good behavior. And for lecture activity four, I would like for you to tell me uh, what you saw in that scenario. So when you imagined yourself being tempted to do your bad behavior, um, how did you uh, imagine yourself not engaging and not giving in to the tempting behavior and instead doing a good behavior? So tell me what you imagined uh, in that activity. So another thing that you can do to help you develop uh, your new behaviors that you'll replace your old bad behaviors with is modeling. So you can find someone that is doing your desired behavior and you would want to study that person. We'll call that person the model and you'd want to reproduce their behavior and compare it with your own behavior. Um, so there's two ways of doing this. Um, there is overt modeling and imagined modeling. Overt modeling is just straightforward imitation. If you have a friend that's good with the ladies and you're trying to be better with the ladies, then do exactly what your friend does from getting ready to going to the club, to going to the club and standing by the bar, to the lines that he uses to pick up on the ladies. Um, so you don't want to put your own spin on it at first because you want to kind of be detached from it emotionally, that it's not the lines that you're using, it's the, just the lines that you're copying because you're doing this exercise. Um, and so if you get rejected using your friend's lines, then it's not going to feel as painful and won't produce as much of a setback as if you can kind of write it off in your mind as, well, that was Joe's line. I, I wouldn't really say that if it was me anyways. So you kind of alleviate some of the ownership. And then another thing you can do is imagine modeling. Uh, so imagined modeling is like if you cannot imagine yourself successfully performing your desired behaviors, like talking to the ladies, uh, you can imagine someone else doing it. Um, but the person that you imagine, uh, again, we'll call them the model, should be like you, have the same problems, can be made up. Um, and you would want to imagine the model, model using the techniques that you would use when you're tempted to do your bad behavior. So for lecture activity five, I would like for you to tell me who could be your model. If you chose to use this technique in your self-change project, who could be your model? And what situation would you model them in? And would this type of modeling be imagined or overt? So go ahead and respond to each of those questions for lecture activity number five. Okay, and the last technique we're going to talk about is called shaping, which is kind of basically just making sub goals and then meeting each sub goal starting with the easiest sub goal and then working your way towards the harder ones. Um, but the definition from your textbook is shaping is the process of steady successive approximations towards a goal. And so a steady experience of success actually reinforces and strengthens your performance as you improve. Um, so one of the things that is a very strong predictor of how successful people will be in this project in doing their good behavior is having high self-efficacy. Um, so since 
having high self-efficacy is a predictor of success. And um, as a reminder, self-efficacy is your belief in your ability to do something. In this case, it would be to do the steps uh, within your project or the, hit the sub goals within your project. So you want to have um, small successes at a time so that you keep getting uh, that feeling of being rewarded for accomplishing your sub goals. Um, and this will act as a um, sort of a thing that helps you to have a higher level of self-efficacy. And then that self-efficacy should uh, help you to have success in your overall project. So one thing that you can do um, with shaping is create a hierarchy. And so you would write your sub goals as positively worded statements generally with shaping. So instead of putting uh, stop eating sugar, you would give yourself a specific good behavior that you could do. So eat fruits and veggies. Um, you don't want to include sub goals that you've already mastered. So think of your baseline. What behaviors towards your goal do you already have mastered? You want to start there. Um, for example, if you're shy but you come to class, then you don't need to start your hierarchy with leave the house. And so what you would do if you use shaping as a technique in your project is you would reward yourself each time you accomplished one of the sub goals. So each time you succeeded a step, you give yourself a small reward and then you can give your big yourself a big reward when you complete the whole hierarchy or however you want to go about the rewarding. Um, but you will in your project be required to reward yourself somehow, even if it's just saying to yourself, good job. So um, this that you see on the slide here is an example of a hierarchy of a guy who had a phobia of flying. And so he started with what he thought would produce the least anxiety um, and he came up with a list of sub goals that would get him to kind of the scariest thing he could imagine, which would be experiencing turbulence. Um, and so uh, this is a great technique for developing sub goals and breaking them down into um, manageable parts. All right, so I would like for you to make a hierarchy for uh, lecture activity six. So make your list of sub goals um, from easiest to most difficult to manage. All right, and that is it for chapter six. Don't forget to um, turn in your lecture activities once you've completed them and also do the assignments for this week. I'll see you on the next video. Have a great day.